The book of Revelation is a book containing a blessing for reading, the admonition of overcoming a wicked world to enjoy a home in heaven with God and Christ, the redeemed of all ages, is a marvelous thought for us to entertain. The key verse of this great book is found in chapter 11, verse 15, where the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and forever. The key word of the book, I think, is the word overcome, and it emphasizes and underscores the victory we enjoy in Christ when we overcome the world. Our study of the book brings us today to the 10th chapter in Revelation. This is sometimes called the episode of the little book. In the book of Revelation, again, we like to review the contents of the book overall. We have an outline where we are following a chain of sevens. There are the seven letters to the seven churches. Then there is a book with seven seals. There are seven trumpets that make announcements. And then there is the seven bowls of wrath followed by the grand finale of the book. In this way, we're able to appreciate the contents of the book of Revelation and to learn more about what, what falls under each heading. We always want to remember the outline that is contained in verse 19 of chapter 1, where the Apostle John is instructed to write the things which he has seen, and we take that to mean chapters 1 to 5, the things which are, chapters 6 through 18, and the things which shall be hereafter, chapters 19, through 22. With these tools in mind, we will find help and assistance in understanding the message of the great book of Revelation. We see in the book of Revelation people being persecuted, the souls under the altar who had given their lives for the testimony of the Word of God. We see them now being vindicated in the destruction of the wicked as we move through the book until ultimately they are raised to sit on thrones with Christ for a long extended period of time known as 1,000 years. And then after those events, we will see the ushering in of eternity in heaven. The book of Revelation is a great book. We're now in that section of the book where we're in between the announcements that are made by the trumpets. This is the sounding of the seventh trumpets, the seven trumpets. And up to this point, we have heard six of them sound. The message has not been a very cheerful one. It is a message of destruction on the wicked. And then we are about to hear the seventh angel sound in the 11th chapter of the book of Revelation. But there's an event here in the 10th chapter that we need to examine before we move on. We will see in the 10th chapter of the book of Revelation, in verses 1 through 3, a mighty angel will be described. In verse 4, we will see a sound of thunders that are sealed up, and we are finding instruction not to be told what those thunders said. And then in verses 5 to 7, we will see that the time for the sounding of the seventh trumpet has now come to pass. Time shall be no more. That is, there will be no more delay as we await the sounding of that last trumpet. And then in the close of the chapter, verses 8 through the end and verse 11, we will see about this little book and what John is told to do with it. Let's take notice of the reading of Revelation 10, starting with verse 1. John wrote, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was, it were, the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot on the earth, and cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, the seven thunders uttered their voice. Let's take notice now of the artist's conception of this opening picture in the book of Revelation. Consider this with me, if you will. Here you have one described as a mighty angel. You'll notice in the artist's conception of this, he's quite a large figure. He has one foot on the land and another foot on the sea. This may indicate that the presence of this angel affects everyone in the world because he is large. Both land and sea are affected by him. Then you'll notice also that there are rainbows said to be about his head. A rainbow was upon his head. And of course, it is a, a beautiful sight to see that rainbow. It calls to our attention the rainbow we noticed back earlier in the book. In chapter 4, when we saw the throne of God, that rainbow in Revelation chapter 4 was an emerald rainbow. And as you will observe the rainbow here, it is about the throne of this, or the head of this mighty angel, like the rainbow was about the throne of God. And then also in his hand is a little book. And that is the part that is of interest within this chapter. He had in his hand a little 
book. And then the Bible says also that he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. So there you have the opening scene in the 10th chapter of the book of Revelation, a mighty angel with a little book in his hand. Now notice with me, if you will, verse 4. In verse 4, when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, John tells us. And then he says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. Now, why would it be the case that you have seven thunders uttering their voices, and John's about to write down the message, but yet heaven forbids him? Don't write what you saw there. Seal that up. Well, that would be God's business, wouldn't it? There's a lesson for us to learn from that in understanding and appreciating the book of Revelation. Not everything in the book of Revelation is meant to be understood. If God wanted us to know the details of every symbol in this book, he would have told us the sound of these thunders, that is, the voice of the thunders, or what it meant. So it would be a mistake to think that we should be able to identify every symbol in the book of Revelation. If we were to take that position, we would, we would be defeated in this verse, Revelation 10, 4, because here God told John, don't write down the meaning of those thunders. Well, that's interesting, and I think there can be encouragement in that for us because there's a lot about the book of Revelation that will remain a mystery to us as we look at the symbolism. This would also show us that sometimes there is symbolism in the book of Revelation that is intended to heighten the imagery being communicated by John. In verses 5 through 7, we have this announcement that there's going to be no more delay until we hear this seven, seventh trumpet to sound. Verse 5 and the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear to him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that are therein and the earth and the things that are therein and the sea and the things that are therein that there should be time no longer but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel when he shall begin to sound the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets." So there should be time no longer, that is, there should be no longer delay until the message being communicated through the sound of the seventh trumpet would be delivered to the reading audience that John is addressing. And then in verses 8 through 11, you have the episode of the little book. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And when I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. The identity of this mighty angel is a matter of some interest to us. It's a matter of speculation on the part of some. We know that this is not a reference to Jesus Christ. Angels are special messengers of God sent forth to accomplish a purpose. Here you see that purpose is to present this little book to John that he takes and he's instructed to eat up. Now then, we know that it is not a reference to Christ for this reason. You remember when the angel says that he swears by him that lives forever and ever, that made, created heaven and all things that are in? Verse 6, well, that would not then be Christ because Christ is the beginning of the creation of God, according to Revelation 3.14. All things were made by him, and for his pleasure they are and were created, according to Revelation 4 at verse 11. In fact, it is the case that in the book of Colossians, the apostle Paul tells us that all things were created by Jesus Christ. In the book of Colossians chapter 1 at verse 15, the apostle wrote that Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist, 
or exist. Therefore, Jesus Christ is the creator. So he would not be seen swearing by himself in this passage of scripture as this mighty angel does. Well, this is an impressive figure who is receiving this book and delivering that book upon request to John. John is told to take it and to eat it. When he eats it, it is immediately bitter in his belly, but it is sweet in his mouth. Now, this is not the first time in the Bible that we have seen a prophet receive instruction to take a book up and eat it. In each instance where we see this in the Bible, and we will examine two others, the message is sweet in the mouth and bitter in the belly. And one of the things that is common to all three occurrences of this phenomenon in the Bible is that the message itself is sweet in the mouth. That is, it's the Word of God, and there's an honor associated with communicating and delivering that message. But the consequences of that message are adverse in some regard, especially to the wicked who are in defiance and disobedience to that same message. Well, let's notice the appearance of the idea of taking the book and eating it and it being sweet in the mouth and bitter in the belly. Let's go to the book of Jeremiah chapter 15 at verse 15. And here, of course, again, we're able to see some of the symbolism in the book of Revelation and the source from which it is drawn. In Jeremiah 15, 15, the Bible tells us, O Lord, thou knowest, remember me and visit me and revenge me of my persecutors. Take me not away in thy long suffering. Know that for thy sake I have suffered rebuke. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. In the next verse, Jeremiah said, I sat not in the assembly of the mockers, nor rejoiced. I sat alone because of thy hand, for thou hast filled me with indignation. That is, Jeremiah was honored to be communicating the word of God to man, but he was faced and confronted with rebuke on the part of others. Notice too, if you will, that in the Bible, there's another occurrence of this that appears, and we will see the same sort of a situation obtaining. And as that situation obtains, you'll find instruction is given to take and to eat the book, it's sweet in the mouth, bitter in the belly. There's another time in the book of Zechariah chapter 5 when there is a flying roll. Now, Zechariah is not told to eat that roll, roll because it's 20 cubits long and 10 cubits wide. No reference made to eating that. But as you've seen in the book of Jeremiah chapter 15 at verses 15 and 16, that clearly is the case. And then the other time appears for us in the book of Ezekiel. Well, the message is the same each time. It's an honor to communicate God's word. The psalmist said in Psalm 19 in verse 10 that thy word is sweet unto me, as sweet as honey and the honeycomb. In keeping of them is great reward. Well, that was the case with John as he receives this little book. It's sweet in his mouth, but it is bitter in his belly. And in our reading thus far of the book of Revelation, we've already come to understand why that would be. We have seen that the people of the earth are persecuting God's people unrepentantly, and they seem not able to be willing to turn from their wrongdoing. And the people of God continue to suffer, and God continues to inflict his judgment upon them. So that would be why it would be difficult for them and make it bitter in John's belly as he consumes this little book. So in Revelation chapter 10, we have the episode of the little book. And it includes the announcement that time will be no longer, that there will be delay. We're ready now for the announcement coming from the seventh trumpet. Our discussion of that will be reserved for next time. For now, Let's notice the challenge to this particular chapter of the Bible that comes to us in the form of premillennialism. You know what the premillennialists do with this chapter of Revelation? They don't know where to put it. Now, I state that based upon the observation from reading from two men. One man, John F. Valverde, says, well, this comes at the beginning of seven years of tribulation. The other man, Hal Lindsey, says this comes at the end of seven years of tribulation. Now, don't you know that if the theory of premillennialism were true, they would at least know where the book goes. They'd at least know where to place this. Why is it that they want to divorce it from its context and move it anywhere? 
Well, as we have seen in previous studies, you have great destruction in earlier chapters, chapter 7 and 8, that are typical in their theory of the Battle of Armageddon, which comes later. I'm telling you, this shows you that premillennialism is a false view. And once you've tried to rip chapter 7 and 8 out of its context here and move it over to chapter 16 or 18, when the Battle of Armageddon doesn't even occur until chapter 19, it is difficult for one to really appreciate the book of Revelation. So now then you're in chapter 10 with this episode of the little book and you don't know where to put it. Valverd puts it at the beginning of this so-called seven-year period of tribulation and Hal Lindsey places it at the end of this seven-year period of tribulation. And then there's another matter that is of great concern that we want to devote attention to in our study of Revelation 10 today and that is that there are among the premillennialists the view and this is absolutely essential to premillennialism. That is, it is always characteristic of premillennialists that they hold a literal view of the book of Revelation. And this appears, the statement appears, if you'd like to read it for yourself, in a book called The Millennial Kingdom, written by John F. Valvert on page 124. It states that a literal interpretation of the book of Revelation is essential to premillennialism. And it also states that modern dispensationalism emerges out of a literal interpretation of Revelation. Now, it's my judgment that the only thing that they really have to have literalized out of this book is the thousand-year reign in chapter 20. And as we're going to see as we approach that, they've got to add and take away from that text in order to get premillennialism into it like they do in other things. But when they come to chapters like chapter 10 here, well, you can read from these men and you'll read them speaking about what something in this chapter symbolizes. And they will even talk about that. This symbolizes. For example, Hal Lindsey says that in chapter 10 in verse 1, this rainbow symbolizes the covenants. And of course, I'm sure that he means by that, going back to Genesis 6 through 9 and the flood of Noah, how that the rainbow symbolized the covenant that God made with mankind that he would never again destroy the earth by water. And that, that rainbow was a symbol or a sign of the covenant. Well, now then, you can't have it both ways. If you're a premillennialist and you have to take everything literal, then how can you say this rainbow symbolizes the covenants? I mean, it is my view that this rainbow points back to the throne of God. And here you have a mighty angel coming from the throne of God to stand with one foot on the sea and one foot on the land, holding this little book in his hand with his hand raised, swearing by God who created the heaven and the earth, affirming that we're going to have the next announcement. To me, that is the meaning of this rainbow, but it could very easily symbolize the covenants because that's a matter of great concern about the throne of God. But if you are saying that this book is literal, then you can't have something to symbolize something else. You would have to say you believe the book contains symbols that mean something else. And when you do that, you give up your Revelation 20 passage and your literal 1,000 year reign, and they're unwilling to do that. Then again, down into the chapter, reference is made here to the angel speaking about the mystery of God being finished. That's in verse 7. Now next I'd like for us to go to a concept that will really consume the balance of the remainder of our time. John F. Valvord says that the mystery of God being finished has reference to a quotation from Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 to 34, where a new covenant was promised to the people of God. And Valver does, like so many other who are premillennial in their view, when they go to the Old Testament and they see reference being made to the kingdom or to the covenant, they always bypass the church. They always look beyond the apostolic age. They always move that out to the end of, the time, end of time and say that the Lord is talking about an earthly millennial kingdom. That's just simply not the case. And it's certainly not true in Jeremiah's case, in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. Now let me show you why we know that to be true. Let's go to Jeremiah 31, 31, and let's begin by reading this text of Scripture. And then what I'm going to do, 
And those of you who know your Bible are not very surprised at what I'm going to do. You're way ahead of me on it, I'm sure. I'm going to go to the New Testament. And I'm going to show you this very passage quoted in the New Testament. And we're going to see the application of it in the New Testament. And what we're going to find is that it is not a reference to something that would take place during a millennial reign of Christ on earth. But rather, it finds fulfillment in the new law going forth from Jerusalem in Acts, the second chapter, the new covenant, the New Testament. Jeremiah 31, 31, the prophet Jeremiah says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, friends, this is why premillennialists have to take this passage and move it beyond the church age. They have to say that it is something that's coming out there in the millennium. The church is not the kingdom because it's a new covenant being made with Israel and with Judah. And they are aware that when it comes to the church, they want to say that the church was an emergency measure. It does not satisfy all of the promises that God made to Israel. They can only be satisfied ultimately and conclusively and finally in a millennial kingdom on earth. That's not true. The fact is the, the promise that is made of a new covenant to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah did go to the Jews first and also to the Greek. Have you read in the New Testament about the gospel being the power of God to the Jew first and also to the Greek in Romans 1 and verse 16? The gospel went to the Jews first in Acts the second chapter. In fact, when you read the opening chapters of the book of Acts, those who are obeying the gospel are Jewish in descent. In Acts chapter 2, devout Jews out of every nation are assembled to worship in Jerusalem and they heard the preaching of the gospel in its fullness for the first time. The 3,000 who are added to the church that day are Jewish people. You'll notice that it would be Jewish people that are multiplied to that number. You'll see also that it would be Jewish people that are multiplied in Acts 6 and verse 7. So here the gospel went first to the house of Israel, and there was a righteous remnant redeemed out of them. Well, that's what Jeremiah is talking about here when he said he'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Notice this. It will not be according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their inward parts and in their hearts and write it in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me, from the greatest of them, from the least of them, unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will, I will forgive their iniquity, and will remember their sin no more. That is Jeremiah's statement. The premillennialists say it has no application to the church. It is something for the kingdom. And the reason they do is because Israel and Judah are mentioned in connection with the new covenant. However... As I promised, turn with me to the book of Hebrews now. Hebrews, the eighth chapter. We're going to go ahead and reread this same text as is quoted by the writer of Hebrews, whom I believe to be the Apostle Paul. In Hebrews chapter 8, at verse 8, For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand be, to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they continued not in my covenant and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people and they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord." For all shall know me from the least to the greatest, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. That's quoted in Hebrews. Why? What's the reason for it being quoted there? Because the writer of the book of Hebrews is wanting the recipients of this book who were Jewish people in Jerusalem to know that God had made a new covenant and blessed them with that new covenant. 
And as we have seen in Hebrews chapter 5 going forward to chapter 8, Jesus Christ is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And that means that he is king and priest simultaneously, and it means that he cannot be a priest on earth. Hebrews 8 and verse 4. And with the change of that priesthood, there must be a change of the law. Now that's what you've got in the first century. When the church is established, you have the new law going forth from Jerusalem. The premillennialists cannot accept that because these people have received a new covenant, a covenant relationship with God for the house of Israel and for the house of Judah. Jewish people have been included into the kingdom of God or the church of Christ. It's interesting that the first time the name Christian appears in the Bible is in Acts 11:26, when both Jew and Gentile are in one body in Christ. <clears throat> I'd like for you to notice why I think it is that people like John Valverde move passages like this past the establishment of the church, past the New Testament era, and place them in an elusive time out in the future called the millennial reign of Christ on earth. It is because they have to overlook the statements that are found in the New Testament about the church being the kingdom. Let's notice a few of these. In Mark 9, 1, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Notice that passage of Scripture. He's speaking about what? The kingdom of God. He's talking about it coming and coming with power. But when? That's the whole point of controversy that we have with premillennialism. When was the kingdom going to come? He says here that there are some of them standing there which would not taste of death till they had seen the kingdom of God come with power. Now, friends, if the kingdom of God didn't come during the lifetime of the people to whom Jesus was speaking, there's some very old people in the world. If premillennialism is true, they're going to have to be 2,000-year-old people at least. Once that kingdom is established, either that or what Jesus said is not true, and who could abide that? I certainly cannot. What I'm looking for in this passage of Scripture is what Jesus meant. And he meant to say that there were some there that during their lifetime would see the kingdom of God come and come with power. Now we know that the kingdom comes with power because in Acts 1 at verse 6, we learn that the power would come when the Holy Spirit came. And we learn that the Holy Spirit came when he was poured out upon the apostles in a baptismal measure in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Now that tells you that the kingdom would come when the power came, the power would come when the Holy Spirit came, and the Holy Spirit came with the baptism of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. Now that's not hard for us to understand or to realize. Acts 1.8 says, Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Acts 2.1 says, When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. That's when the kingdom came, is in Acts the second chapter. And you know that because the Lord was adding people to His church, which was His kingdom in verse 47, even as we learn in Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 and 19. Notice, in Acts chapter 8 and verse 12, we have reference being made to the kingdom of God. Let's read several of these from the book of Acts. Acts 8, 12. But when they believed Philip, preaching things Concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. What was Philip preaching? Things concerning the kingdom of God. To what effect did the people think that it would bring them in that regard? That they could receive remission of sins and be added to the church of our Lord. They were baptized, both men and women. Next we notice in Acts chapter 17, at verse 7, that Jesus Christ was understood to be king and during the time this book was written. Acts 17, 7 says, whom Jason hath received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there's another king, one Jesus. Not there will be another king, but there is another king, one Jesus. Friends, the book of Acts is filled with instances like this. Look further in Acts chapter 19 and verse 8. And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading things concerning the kingdom of God. 
Now that's what Paul was doing, dis disputing and persuading things concerning the kingdom of God. What would be the urgency if the millennial reign of Christ on earth wasn't occurred, occurred during his lifetime or the lifetime of hundreds of thousands of millions of people down through time until you get out toward the end of time? No, Paul was concerning, speaking things concerning the kingdom of God because he wanted people to be baptized just like Philip did earlier so that the Lord would add them to his church, which is his kingdom. Let's look at another of these passages. This time, Acts chapter 28 at verse 23. This is toward the close of the book, as you know, the last chapter of it. And Paul had been preaching the kingdom of God. He had been on three missionary journeys and now then a voyage to Rome. And in Acts 28, 23, we read, And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him unto his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning until evening." What was Paul doing as people came to him? He would go to the Old Testament, to Moses and the prophets, like, for example, in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 and following. You know he did that because he's the one who wrote it in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 8 and following. And he would tell them about the kingdom of God and urge their membership in it. In the closing verse of the book of Acts, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus with all confidence, no man forbidding him. The kingdom of God is preached in the beginning of the book of Acts at chapter 2. And as we have seen throughout the books, chapter 8, verse 12, chapter 9, chapter 19, verse 8, moving on through the book to chapter 28, verse 23, and then 31, you have the subject matter of the kingdom of God being preached. But that's not all. Look with me, if you will, over in 1 Thessalonians in chapter 2. Here you're going to see letters that are written to Christians to admonish them to faithfulness. And what do you have? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 at verse 12, that you would walk worthy of God who hath called you into his kingdom and glory. Now here Paul's writing to Christians telling them that God has called them. He, that's past tense. He had called them into his kingdom and glory, not a future kingdom. The kingdom was established and in place at that time. Another passage of Scripture is Colossians 1 and verse 13, where these people were being delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son. Let's notice also in Colossians 4 and verse 11, And Jesus, which is called Justice, who are of the circumcision, these only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. There you'll have Paul speaking about those who are fellow laborers in the kingdom of God. Another of these verses appears in 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 at verse 5. Paul writes, Which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which also ye suffer. Now these Christians were undergoing tribulation. It wasn't a seven-year period of tribulation, but it was tribulation. You know that because you see in verse 6, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you and to you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. What were these people doing in 2 Thessalonians 1, 5, and 6? They were endeavoring to be counted worthy of the kingdom of God and they were willing to suffer for it. The kingdom of God was not a future matter to occur. It wasn't a future institution that would happen many centuries later, many millenniums later. Oh no. It was something they were in. They'd been translated into it and they were suffering for it. Another of the verses in the New Testament as we have seen is in the book of Revelation chapter 1 and verse 9. The same thing that is said of the brethren in Thessalonica is said of John exiled to Patmos in Revelation 1 9. He writes and affirms, I John who am also your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom of God's dear Son, in the kingdom of Christ and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And then you'll notice that verse in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 to 34, quoted in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 8 and following, where you have this new covenant to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. This covenant would include forgiveness of sins. Friends, do you not know that if, how, if John Valvert and Hal Lindsey are correct, that Jeremiah 31, 31 applies to a future millennial kingdom, what about the remission of our sins? 
That was what was going to be accomplished by this new covenant for us to enjoy the forgiveness of our iniquities. Without that covenant, we have no forgiveness of sins. We are yet in our iniquities. Again, ample reason to reject the false view known as premillennialism. And then one verse is all we'll have time left for today to explore on this topic, and that is 1 Corinthians 15, verse 23 and 24. Had we said nothing else at all about the church being the kingdom and the kingdom existing now, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 23 and 24 would sustain the case in and of itself. In this passage of Scripture where Paul is talking about the resurrection of the body, he says in verse 23, But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. Now what's the subject? The coming of Christ. This is the resurrection chapter of the Bible where we have explained to us the hope of the resurrection from the dead. Notice verse 24. Then cometh the end. Now when will the end come? It will come at the coming of Christ. Then will come the end. When he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. This passage of Scripture tells us what's going to happen in the end when Christ comes. He's going to deliver up the kingdom to God. That implies that the kingdom must be here when He comes. He's not coming back to set up a kingdom, ladies and gentlemen. He's coming back to deliver up the kingdom to God. Just the opposite of what the premillennialists have been arguing all along. Their failure to understand the kingdom of Jesus Christ has, as to me, its worst effect of keeping men and women out of it. The kingdom is not important because it's not here. The church is not the kingdom because you have the church on the one hand, the kingdom out yonder. No, the church is the kingdom. And when Christ comes back, He's going to deliver it up to God and He's going to put down all rule and power and authority. How can you know that Christ is reigning? Because death is in the world. He's going to reign as long as there is death in the world. And then he's going to deliver up his everlasting kingdom. Revelation 10 and the episode of the little book is very encouraging to study. And we invite you back next time as there will be no more delay when we get into chapter 11 and hear the seventh trumpet sound. I'm following Jesus because he